Alrighty, everybody. Week one is now over. So, let's do this. Let's talk about it. Um, Thursday and Friday night, we had a couple of big time matchups here. All right, not really big time, but these were key matchups in conference for both of these teams. And Ohio State got through a tricky Minnesota team who ran the ball all over their defense with Ibrahim, who unfortunately got injured, and now his season is pretty much over. You know, for the Golden Gophers. But C.J. Stroud, he looked all right out there. You know, he threw t four touchdowns. He looked okay. He did. He didn't look like a world beater out there. You know, Olave caught two touchdowns as well. I forgot. I keep forgetting to mention him, but now I'm mentioning him now. You know, very good wide receiver. And then defense for Ohio State finally stepped up in the second half. So, and Braxton Burmeister. He looks good for Virginia Tech. He looked real good directing that Virginia Tech offense. And Sam Howell looks so lost out there. You know, North Carolina struggled, struggled. And they were the first team in the top 25 to tumble, tumble down, taking in the L. One of eight top 25 teams. Thought five were going to lose. We knew five were going to lose, but we didn't know that we were going to be eight. And potentially could have been ten, at least ten, maybe even more. Top 25 teams could have lost this week. You know, certainly making sure that those preseason rankings do not mean anything. Because hell, my preseason ranking, you know, the ones that had like the AP Bowl or something like that in there, yeah, those were completely out of date because, you know, the other ones got released a couple days later. And then, you know, they had other teams on there that weren't, you know, some of the teams in that poll that I had in the video back when. Um, but yeah. Speaking of teams, how about the FCS? Six FCS teams beat FBS opponents. Congratulations to Holy Cross, who beat UConn in a way so disrespectfully. And UConn basically said to Randy Edsall, you're gone, after Edsall said he was going to retire. And Edsall's gone from UConn. What a horrid way to go out. What a horrid way to go out. You know, because UConn, UConn might go 0 12 in all honesty. Just man, that is not how you wanna that is not how you wanna go out by losing like that. Washington. This was un this is inexcusable. Yeah, Montana's a pretty tough team. You know, they're always tough in the FCS, but you cannot play terrible on offense like this. You know you only scored seven points. Do better, Washington. Do better. I don't even have to explain how bad Vanderbilt got whooped by Eastern Tennessee State. You Vanderbilt, what's wrong with you? You can't get whooped like that. They got whooped out there. I mean, you also got a couple close ones like Eastern Washington beating ULV and UC Davis beating Tulsa. But, you know, those those losses don't even compare to Washington getting beat like that. And, and UConn getting beat as well to the point where they fired their coach. It's not even... But, you know, that's not even the worst loss on this list. The worst one was an angry, we're talking angry, South Dakota State team. Remember, this team just played for a championship four months ago. They were playing for their first idol four months ago. And... They just proceed to whip up on Colorado State. And keep in mind, remember when Colorado State applied for the Big 12? Yeah, that's not happening now. And there's a reason for that. South Dakota State just whooped up on them. And, you know, I mean, good God. You didn't have to, you didn't have to do that. So you didn't have to do that, Jax. You didn't have to do that. You know? You could have just maybe make it a little bit closer for the Rams. You know, just a little bit closer. No? Just going to keep whipped up on them. I expect South Dakota State to have a really, really interesting season, especially now that they didn't beat Colorado State like that. So, speaking of the Big 12, how about it? Expansion. It's time. And who are the lucky numbers? Who are the lucky teams that are going to be coming to the Big 12? Well, UCF, BYU, Cincinnati, and Houston. Congratulations. You've made the cut. Essentially, you've made the cut. Now, there are some meetings and things that need to be worked out. And essentially, it looks like these four teams will be the next Big 12 teams. And it enhances both college football 
and I'll go off a topic for a little bit, you know, here for a minute. This this impacts both college football and college basketball. You know, first let's talk about the college football aspect of it, then I'll move to the college basketball part. This is probably going to be unrelated to the whole thing, um, just to you know get it all out there. But for college football, this impacts the Big 12 greatly. This is a good move by the conference. For the most part, you know, still a little bit of geography needs to be taken, but you know, you know, geography lessons do not matter when it comes to these conferences anymore. And this is a great move because you know, all four of these teams have had some recent success in college football. And I mean, I mean, just come on, Cincinnati is nationally ranked. You know, UCF has a national championship. BYU has a national championship. Houston was once, you know, buddies with the with at least several of these Texas teams in the Southwest Conference. You know, they were buddies back in the day. Buddy, buddy, when the Southwest Conference was still a thing. You know, I wasn't born when the Southwest Conference was a thing, but, you know, things change. If Houston wanted in years ago. We could have had the Big 12 back at 12 years ago, at least. You know, with Houston and Louisville. You know, I don't know what I don't know what West Virginia would have done. I would imagine had you know had had it been you know a decade ago and things were a little bit different. Louisville would be in the Big 12. West Virginia would be in the ACC. I'm just saying. That's you hear over there. So now, what does that mean? You know, what is Texas and Oklahoma going to do now? Because uh, when are they going to leave? I'm still thinking 2022 or 2023. I'm thinking. I don't think they want to play with UCF, BYU, Cincy, and Houston. I don't think they want to do that. I genuinely don't want that. I, I am beyond done with playing BYU as a Texas fan. You know, two embarrassments by Taysom Hill way back when, a decade ago. I'm, I don't want that. I don't want to see that again. I'm, I'm, I'm through with that. And you know, Houston beating up, beating the long courts a couple times back. You know, way before I was even thought of. You know, so I don't, I don't want to think about playing Houston either. So, you know, and you know, now what does the American do? Who do they get? They have to get somebody from Conference USA because, you know, I don't think they should be getting Sun Belt teams. I don't, but I mean, they're probably going to get some Sun Belt teams anyway. I think they should, you know, help Conference USA out. You know, take two teams from there. You know, especially in metropolitan areas. Hint, hint. UAB and Rice probably. Uh, you know, and it just, it just does impact the Sun Belt as well. You know, what is the Sun Belt going to do? You know, because I mean, they, they could they could expand. You know, there could be some FCS teams that get to move up from this as well. So you you really you really don't know. We don't know how all this is going to work out, but we do know at least for right now, it'll be UCF, BYU, Cincinnati, and Houston. Put probably ninety. 5% certain that they're going to the Big 12 now. 95%. Hopefully, it goes to 100% real soon. But we'll, we'll see what happens in the next week or so. So, don't worry. Don't worry, everybody. And let's talk about the Saturday slate and Sunday-Monday games, too. Mostly the Saturday slate. So, Penn State and Wisconsin was a complete comedic Farce. Let me tell you, this game was 0-0 heading into halftime. We're talking Sean Clifford had 47 yards passing. Wisconsin was out here missing kicks and getting no momentum in the red zone. We're talking this was just this was just rough. Head State was able to get out of here with a W somehow. The points started coming in the second half. But man, this kind of kind of went with what I said a couple weeks ago where where both these teams are just not really up to par. They're not. You know, obviously I'm overreacting a little bit, but both these teams just did not deliver in this game. Not at all. What about those Oklahoma Sooners? That defense. I thought it was improved. It looked like it was improved last year. You know, obviously a couple of times notwithstanding because they lost twice last year, but Tulane, a a very very hungry Tulane, a very very ready Tulane, who came who came expecting a home game in you know 
in New Orleans or around New Orleans, not in New Orleans exactly, but around New Orleans in the New Orleans area, and then Hurricane Ida s decided to come in and smack that uh, all away, and thus this game had to go to Norman. You know, sure, Oklahoma made Tulane feel at home, but not like this. Yeah, Rattler got four touchdowns, but he threw two picks. This was shades of Spencer Rattler from early in the season last year. Y you know, you cannot do that. You cannot throw a couple picks like that. Hell, I think he even threw a pick on, like, what, the second play of the game. You can't do that. Oklahoma, you have to get it together really quick. You cannot let this happen in Big 12 play. You cannot give up a 23-point lead in Big 12 play. You cannot do that. You cannot. You want to be respected, you know, because, you know, people like to say that Oklahoma's overrated every year. You have to take care of Tulane. 40-35 to 35 is not going to cut it. Not going to cut it. And that is a big overreaction. You know, big overreaction. Maybe it's probably right. I don't know yet. You know, but Oklahoma has to do a lot better, you know, and hopefully they do in the coming weeks to come. Um, so moving on later in the day, we had a little bit of a had a little bit of a jam packed later day, um, or rather later in the day, not later. Um, well, I mean I guess they mean the same thing, but that's not important. Um Kayvon Thibodeau, he got injured for Oregon, so Hopefully he's fine. You know, I mean, it was. I don't know what the entry was. I forgot what the entry was. I looked at some highlights and I was like, wait, what? What was the entry again? But that's not even the worst thing about this. Is that the worst thing about this is that Oregon struggled against Fresno State. Really, really struggled. I mean, if it weren't for three Fresno State fumbles, I think Fresno State would have upset Oregon. I genuinely think that. You know, you, Oregon, I mean, what's what's going on out there? What's going on out there in duck country? What's going on? You have a big test next week. You have a big test. You cannot, you cannot have these close names like this. And, you know, I mean, speaking of close games, Iowa State played way too close with Northern Iowa. I mean, this was this was to be expected, you know. A beating, a beating was supposed to be expected from Iowa State. They were supposed to hand out a beating to Northern Iowa, you know. You know, it's not. I mean, these games don't really count for FCS teams yet. Yeah, says there's a loss in the win-loss column for FCS teams, but this doesn't really count too much towards them, you know, unless they win, of course, you know. Then it, that that really counts. But you cannot play close like that with an FCS team, Iowa State. You can't do that. You have a big matchup with Iowa next week. What's going on? Can't play like that. Can't do it. Can't do it. Cannot do it. USC. Oh, boy. Cannot play the way you played against San Jose State. You scored 30 points. But Graham Harrell is still not a good offensive coordinator. I will continue to say that until I die. He's not a good offensive coordinator. Just not at all. And this air raid scheme, as I take out my charger there, this air raid scheme that USC's been doing for the last, what, two or three years now, has not really worked all that much. It, it's been effective, but it hasn't worked to the extent where you want the air raid to be working. Rip. I mean, just they, they have to keep the momentum up. USC does. They have to keep the momentum smooth out here. You know, you cannot mess up anymore. If you want to be back in the Pac-12, you want to be back nationally, you cannot, you cannot play like that. You cannot. Um, all right, Indiana, I, I said it. I, I called it, and they got, they got bitch slapped by Iowa. They got bitch slapped. We're talking... Two pick sixes by Riley Moss. We're talking. Indiana got took an outs pasture, got shot up, beat up, thrown into the trash. And I mean, they're probably going to get dropped right out the top 25, you know, really quick. With the quickness, we're talking. And I told, and I said it, Indiana was not really that great of a team last year, and I don't think they'll be that great of a team this year. 
and you know things just got a little bit easier you know for some teams that are playing Indiana later down the line you know, they, they, they could that defense why was scary though really really scary could be seeing something interesting from them real soon mm -hmm. all right so um, what about my Texas Longhorns real quick what about my Longhorns yes Hudson card he looked good out there yes B. John ran ran all over Louisiana rich engagements ran all over him. and the play, but the play call play call Steve Sarkeesian's play call it's so beautiful where has this been the last five years? And I'm overreacting as hell to this. I'm overreacting. I'm beyond overreacting. This play calling is great out there. This is the type of play calling that Tom Ehrman should be having. You know, this is the type of play calling that should be happening out there. You know, making that defense, you know, really, really read the play. Making that defense look foolish out there. You know, that's the type of stuff you want from a Texas Longhorns football team on offense. And the defense didn't look too bad either. You know, sure, 38-18 to 18 is really the score you want. Yeah, but, I mean, hey, Louisiana returned pretty much everybody from last year, so you you expect, you know, a little bit of pushback. But remember, remember, people thought this game was going to be a lot closer. And it wasn't. So thank, thankfully, 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 we can say that Texas Texas took care of somebody for once. Congratulations. We did it. We did it, guys. We took care of a team we were supposed to take care of for once. Now, can the Longhorns keep that momentum up? I wonder. I really wonder. So, I mean, I'm not even going to lie to you. Again, like I said, you know, way back when in that preseason Top 25 video, there could be two or three losses on, on this team this year. There could be. There really could be because, you know, I do not want to fall in the old traps. You know, the Longhorns have had to fall into some traps. And this was the first one. You know, there's going to be plenty of more traps throughout the year that the Longhorns need to get through unscathed. Especially before Oklahoma in October. You know, there's going to be plenty of matchups that look like they're easy on paper, look, look easy, look like cupcakes on paper. And then. Texas rolls over and lays an egg. So, you know, there's that. But Alabama, 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 Alabama just dominated Miami. I mean, Bryce Young threw four touchdowns. The defense reloaded and harassed Deer King all day long. And Alabama just, just took Miami out to the woodshed and put them in the trash as well. So Miami overrated another year, yeah. You know, it's about that time you know, already. It ain't, it ain't even been one week, Miami fans. It's okay. You'll be going to a bad bowl game, I imagine. I can imagine a bad bowl game, you know, somewhere in your future, Miami Hurricanes fans. But it's okay. You guys can still win the Coastal. You know, the Coastal is ready for some chaos. It's already had some chaos already, you know. But Alabama, it looks like it's going to be Alabama versus everybody else again. I don't really want that. You know, it looks like it could be, you know, maybe Georgia could do something about that. Speaking of Georgia, now let's talk about that Georgia-Clemson game. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Man. We're talking. DJ Uyulagale got dominated out there. Seven sacks. A pick six. Georgia had, had Clemson only running for, what, one yard? For most of the game, they only had Clemson only had like one yard rushing, pretty much the entire game. That's how good that Georgia defense is. It's a shame Georgia's offense couldn't capitalize and make this game even worse. Because I mean, yeah, ten to three, you know, really isn't nothing to write home about. But it shouldn't have even been close. It really shouldn't have been. This was a dominant ten to three score, not. Not a 10-3 score where it was a struggle for both teams. This was a 10-3 score where it should have been really both sides of the ball for Georgia dominating. But instead, only the defense dominates, not the offense. You know, because, I mean, Georgia played it way too safe. No offensive touchdown scored. The only score was that pick, but to that pick six. That was it. So A&M, you know, speaking of another team, you know, in 
the SEC, the Texas A&M Aggies, they put up 600 yards against Kent State, despite looking a little sluggish at first, but that's okay. You know, A&M, their momentum is also skyrocketing. They, they need to keep it up. They need to keep it up. They want that Alabama matchup, that big-time Alabama matchup, that sweet, sweet, you know, prime-time Alabama matchup in October, probably on CBS. Yeah, so A&M needs to keep their momentum going. Don't be sluggish. You know, you can't be sluggish against Alabama. Don't do that. Okay? You know, you see how you see how they did against Miami. So, you know, you cannot let you cannot let yourselves be sluggish. Okay? Okay, A&M. Okay? Just once. We're asking you to do something nice for once. You know, as a Texas fan, as a Longhorns fan, we're asking you to do something nice for once, and that's beat Alabama. So... <laughs> Um, how about the Florida Gators? Embry Jones, not a good quarterback. I, I've said this already. This is not, it just doesn't do anything for me. He, he, I mean, this is like Tim Tebow before he became the Florida Gators starter. He just didn't do what he, he just didn't really do too much. You know, he sure, you know, he can make some big plays for you, you know, but it's not like. Tebow throws a jump pass every week or something like that. Or Tebow does something great every week. Or Kyle Trask does something great every week. You know, it's not like that. Emory Jones and Florida have to do something. They have to do something. You know, because Georgia's in the SEC, you know, waiting for them. And Florida has to get something going. They have to get the momentum going. They have to keep things, you know, moving at a pace to where they can look dominant and this was not dominant their their first game not a dominant performance at all so how about the Bruins oh yes two non-conference wins for Chip Kelly that's two more than he's had his entire career here at UCLA they just smacked LSU we're talking UCLA took LSU punched them in the mouth and kept running all over them Zach Charbonnet ran all over him. DTR, you know, he didn't he didn't really throw the ball too much, but when he did, those big plays were effective. Nine for sixteen, like two hundred sixty yards, and I mean, man, UCLA, holy holy hell, man, could this be a UCLA team that competes for a Pac-12 title with Chip Kelly? Because we've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for this UCLA team to get going with Chip Kelly. We've been waiting. Could it be this year? Could it be? UCLA gets going. We'll find out. We'll find out, of course. We'll find out how that goes. And late, speaking of other Pac-12 teams, late, 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 late in the night, Pac-12 after dark. Pac-12 North had pretty much imploded after Washington State and Cal lost. You know, Washington already lost, Oregon State lost, and I mean, you know, it was just not a good time. Not a good time. You know, Stanford had lost early in the day as well, so I mean, you know, the Pac-12 North is just pretty much dead. You know, the Pac-12 North could pretty much eliminate themselves, you know, by next week from the college ball playoff discussion. And Arizona, Arizona in the South Division, they got smacked around by BYU. They get bullied out there. Be with that balanced attack BYU has, they got bullied. You know, you cannot be bullied out there by BYU. You know, Arizona, you know, I'm sure sure this is the post-Kevin Sumlin era, but, you know, you can't get bullied like that. Man, oh, man. I'd do better. What about Sunday and Monday? Because there were, a, there were about four games. You know, there was some other games as well. It was like a, it was like a, um, it's like a D2 game that ESPN had, but that's not really important. I didn't even watch that. Didn't even pay for that. Didn't even pay attention to that. So what about that Orange Blossom Classic? Um, first things first. This, these two HBCU games showed me that the SWAC was is it's gonna be tough this year. It's gonna be tough because I don't again, like I said in one of these preview videos, I forgot which one. Um, the HBCUs, they don't get a lot of attention. When they do, you know, certainly, you know, Deion Sanders is going to be leading the charge. You know, now that he's Jackson State to the coach, and I really did not think highly of Jackson State. You know, but they, they played their little hearts out on defense, and even though this Orange Blossom Classic was absolutely terrible, 
We're talking 7-6. to six. That was the final score. Jackson State won. Terrible, terrible. Defense was on point. Grambling as well. Their defense was on point against the debut of Eddie George, and now he's head coaching. You know, Eddie George is now coach of the Tennessee State Tigers. And the Tigers, you know, they play the Tigers of Grambling tough, but, you know, Grambling got out with that W in the end. But what this shows me is that the SWAC is going to be unpredictable this year. It's going to be very unpredictable. I don't know who's coming out of this conference. I don't know who's going to win it. You know, but keep an eye on that conference. Keep an eye in the background on it. It's going to, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. And on Sunday night, Sunday night, Jack Cohn. Now we all thought of him as a game manager, but here he was slinging the rock against Florida State. He slung four touchdowns on him. I believe he got the passing record, too, for a single game. It was like three, 200 or 360-something yards, something like that. And, you know, Notre Dame looked sus. <laughs> what, you thought I was going to say they looked good out there? No, they didn't look good out there. They got ran over by Florida State. We're talking this Florida State team ran all over Notre Dame. Sure, Jack Cone balled out, but you cannot have a run defense that bad. I mean, this was supposed this should have been the game plan the entire game, but instead, Mike Norvell made a couple of dumb decisions. You know, first he went for it, like it was like fourth and two or something like that. And you know, it it just it just didn't work out. It didn't work out. It was like fourth and two with like his own thirty yard line. It didn't work out didn't work out well at all and you know the other big play comes later but I'm, I'm very glad that you know Jordan Travis got knocked out of the game you know he got his helmet knocked off and you left the field you know because you're supposed to leave the field for a play you know after you know you get your helmet knocked off and guess who came in Mackenzie Milton Mackenzie Milton oh yes the former UCF star, the, you know, the, the man that won UCF a national championship, came back on the field after a thousand days of not being able to play. And guess what he did? He led that Florida State team back into this game, led them back, tied it up, said we're going to overtime. But then Mike Norvell just, oh my goodness gracious, oh dear lord. You know, sure, it was the right call, but Norville essentially iced his own kicker. You know, sure, it was it was the wrong spot. It was actually the wrong spot because it was like a 50-yarder that the kicker originally made, but the ball was supposed to be at the 19-yard line and wide left. And you know how Florida State fans are when you mention the words wide left or wide right. Not a good time. Not a good time. So Florida State loses. Unfortunately, you know, defense for Florida State still isn't that good. You know, they named they, they, they got torched by again, they got torched by Cone, but the bigger takeaway from this is that Notre Dame barely scraped out of this. And this is not a recipe, you know, for success. This is not a recipe for Notre Dame to be able to be trying to get back to the college football playoff. It's, it's not it's not going to work. You cannot have run defense like that. That gets run all over by different backs for Florida State. You cannot have that happen. And on Monday night, there was only one game on Monday night, but Louisville, Ole Miss, Louisville got blown out. This really was the story of Matt Corral, you know, and this Ole Miss offense speedily. We're talking this team can go. They can, they can really, really go. They were running plays, you know, taking only 15 seconds off the clock. This is shades of Baylor out here. Shades of Baylor, honestly. This Ole Miss team looks like a team that could be contending. Remember, some places had them ranked number 25. You know, I think I, I think the video I did had them ranked 25. The where, the where I was getting my um, information and my notes for that video from. That some some places had them ranked 25, but man, could this Ole Miss team 
How, 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 how far can they go? How fast can they go? How fast can they go? It, it, you know, how fast can they rise? You know, how can how can they how they can keep going, keep the momentum going because they have a lot of tough games coming up. And I'm wondering what what will this team do? You know. But in it on the bad side of things, you know, there was a lot of targeting, a lot of targeting, so many targeting calls. Can we not, please. I'm tired of targeting. I'm tired of targeting college ball. Can we change the rule or something? How many players are going to get ejected? from this Ole Miss LSU game. I have no idea. I think it was like six or seven targeting calls. My goodness. Stop it. It's time to stop targeting. You know, somebody change the rules real quick, please. But yeah. Whew. That's a lot. I promise the videos won't be this long for this anymore. <laughs> Hopefully. But you never know. There, there's just, there was just a lot to take in from this week. Because, I mean, this was the opening week of the season. Just a lot to take in. Next week should be a little bit lighter. In fact, the in fact the week two preview will be premiering in under twelve hours. It won't be twelve hours from now, but it will be under twelve hours that it will be premiering. So you guys can you know go ahead and look at that, look at this over the night, and you know come back straight up watch the preview for week two, you know real quick and everything like that as well. So college football is back, man. And back in full force. I'll see you all, you know, again very, very soon on Tuesday with the week two preview. And then, you know, either, yeah, actually, probably Wednesday, actually, for week one of the NFL because the NFL is back, baby. So we'll see how that goes. All right, y'all. Take, take care. Have a good night. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow.